Hello, this unit is on convolutional neural networks. We're gonna go through the basics uh, in somewhat historical order. So let's start by reviewing some of the history. So these, this is performance on ImageNet classification, image classification, starting in 2010 before the deep revolution. So what you're seeing here as we go from 2010 to 2012, there's an enormous jump in performance. So what, these numbers are um, accuracy in the top five predictions. So you take an image, the system predicts a list of five most likely categories, and if one of those categories is correct, dog, fish, sturgeon, if one of those categories is correct, you get it right. So before the deep revolution, they were at about 25% accuracy at the top five. AlexNet 2012, dropped that dramatically. And then the next year, sort of refinements of AlexNet um, improved things and then things got dramatically better over time. Um, the other thing that's happening is that these networks are getting deeper. So AlexNet was eight layers and for, for 2012 and 13. Then there was a 19 layer network, uh, VGG, that's the network I'm gonna show in the figures. Um, then 22 layers, and then in uh, 2015, there was a dramatic improvement due to a, a really important architectural innovation called ResNet, or residual connections. And we're going to do that later in the class. What we're going to do now is sort of use VGG as, uh, as an example of what is now a fairly early convolutional neural network. So here's VGG, um, 2014. So in the previous unit, we did a, a very quick uh, discussion of convolutional neural networks. The convolution layers are these little boxes where you have um, X and Y coordinates, spatial dimensions, and then sort of neuron coordinates. The, the, this additional index is saying what neuron value or what you, um, feature value you're looking at in this tensor. Now the batch index is being suppressed, suppressed from this figure. Um, so we're just looking at one instance. Um, so each box is a tensor. If we include the batch index, the tensor has a batch index, an X coordinate, a Y coordinate, um, and a, a neuron coordinate. Um, and each value in this tensor is the output of some unit, some linear threshold unit. And so this is what we did briefly in the last unit, but let's review it now because now we're focusing on, on, on these networks. So um, these are boxes. They have X, Y coordinates and unit coordinates. And to compute an, an element of the next layer, the value of a particular neuron in the next layer, you look at all the neurons in the previous layer within a neighborhood of this layer. And that's get, that gets written this way. To compute a particular um, value in the next layer, you look at the previous layer. This is L, the L plus one layer. You look at the previous layer and you iterate over all entries in a neighborhood of X, Y. So you iterate over all entries that are within a certain range of delta X and delta Y of the X, Y coordinates. And you iterate over all the neurons at that coordinate. And for each uh, input uh, neuron, you take a weight that's coming from this matrix and this matrix, oh, this weight tensor. And this weight tensor has an entry for each delta X, delta Y and choice of input uh, neuron. And then there's a bias term that depends on what, on the particular neuron you're computing a value for. So this is a, this is just a linear, this is a linear combination compared to a bias pass through the uh, activation function, the kind of threshold function. Okay, if you look at the PyTorch, if you go to the PyTorch tutorial and you get familiar with PyTorch and you look at the PyTorch implementation code for a 2D convolutional neural network, uh, you see that it takes a lot of um, parameters and these parameters are controlling various features of a 2D convolutional layer. And what we're gonna do now 
is go through these features and sort of explain what they're doing and how they relate to the larger convolutional neural network. So we've already talked about the input. The input is just this L, this uh, four index tensor, if you include the batch index of uh, a tensor that has a batch index, an XY index, and the uh, neuron index. Then there's this weight uh, tensor that we also talked about. There's the bias parameter, which we've also talked about. Then we have these stride, padding, dilation, and groups parameters. So I'm going to go through, um, in, in this unit, I'm going to go through the stride and padding parameters. And the dilation and groups parameters, I'm going to say for a different unit. They're significantly more obscure. OK, padding. One of these parameters is padding. So if you look at uh, this figure, if I want to compute uh, the, the neuron outputs in the corner here, you can see that the neighborhood goes off the image. So the way this is uh, handled is to take the input image and expand it. Pad it, typically you pad it with zeros. So what we're going to do is take an input image, which is shown here in blue, and we're going to add padding around it and put zeros in this uh, region around the image. Um, so this looks like it might be a little bit of a pain to code, but uh, in, in NumPy Python, there's this really simple way to do this. So um, if we're given uh, a, a, a tensor X containing this, containing our data, X, Y, and index, um, and we want to produce a padded version, what we do is we create the, a zero tensor, a tensor that's zero, um, that where we've added to the width and the height by twice the padding width we want. So if we want to pad by one, we're adding two to the width and the height. And then we take a slice of that tensor and set it to X. So there's really easy NumPy Python code to, to do this padding. So if we, so now what the network looks like is you take, you take a padded version of your previous layer and then to compute the layer, the next layer, um, when we go to compute the next layer, uh, when we want to compute, um, in the next layer, we can basically take the delta, in the, in the previous layer, we took the delta x and the delta y to have negative values. In the next layer, we can take delta x and delta y to be strictly positive, so that we start in the corner of the padded layer. So this is the padded layer, L prime, and so we can start in the corner and always be adding positive delta x and delta y. Um, just a little trick. So in, in practice, the delta x and delta y are positive values. OK, if we look at VGG, um, we clearly see that the spatial dimensions are being reduced, right? We start with uh, tensors, convolutional tensors that are the full spatial dimension, and then the spatial dimensions are getting smaller. And eventually, as this network gets narrower, eventually we're classifying the image into one of a thousand categories. So the spatial dimensions come down to one spatial dimension and a final classification. So the question is, how are we going to reduce the spatial dimension, or how do these networks reduce the spatial dimension? Here they're being reduced by a factor of two. Um, and there are two ways to do it. The, there's an, a sort of a, a more traditional, an older way to do it, and sort of a modern way to do it. And the older way to do it is called max pooling. So in max pooling, what we're going to do is take the next dimension, and the next dimension is going to um, uh, be smaller, right? The, the x, y dimensions of the next layer are going to be smaller by a factor of two. So what we're going to do is, is as to pick a, a, a certain value here in the smaller, this is going to be a smaller tensor, smaller spatial dimension, to pick a value here, we're going to look into the appropriate place in the larger spatial dimension and to find the appropriate place, say this is being reduced by a factor of two, we're going to take the smaller coordinates and multiply them by two. We're going to um, sort of upsample 
uh, multiplying these coordinates by a factor of two to get the appropriate place in the previous layer. And then we're going to take a neighborhood of that layer, just like we did in a convolutional layer. But instead of uh, taking a linear combination over these, we're going to take each neuron, each unit value, and set it at the smaller label, at the smaller layer. This is the smaller layer. We're going to set it to be a max over the neighborhood of that unit at the larger layer. So to get the, to get the smaller layer, smaller spatial dimension, we're taking a neighborhood in the larger layer and um, taking the max value over that, uh, over that region. And this is uh, like if you had an edge detector and the edge was at a slightly different place, this max pooling was designed to allow some deformation or shift in where that item that you're trying to detect is. So that was sort of the motivation for this max pooling. Okay, a more popular modern method is to just um, introduce a strided convolution. So here, um, again, we're going to construct something that's smaller. So this is going to have smaller xy coordinates. And uh, when we go to compute the value at a smaller xy coordinate, we're going to find the appropriate place in the larger uh, tensor. So if we're reducing by a factor of two, we want to take the small coordinates and multiply them by two to find the appropriate place in the larger tensor. But then we're just going to use a standard convolution um, equation. So we're going to use a standard linear threshold unit that's using a standard weight matrix, but at the neighbor, at, but just centered at the appropriate neighborhood in the previous layer, in the previous layer at a larger dimension. Um, and so if the stride is greater than one, then the spatial dimension is reduced by whatever the stride is. Okay, so here in this picture, um, we, these red boxes uh, are max pooling layers in the uh, VGG architecture. Uh, and these black boxes are, the convol are just convolution layers. Um, th these red boxes could be replaced by strided layers um, we'll talk about why that makes more sense in modern networks. Uh, and then we go down to, um, we, we reach a point where we have only a single spatial dimension. So this is done by a simple little trick moving to the fully connected layers. These are called the fully connected layers. So a single spatial dimension makes sense, right? It's saying there's only one place, there's only one XY value, but we're still doing uh, linear threshold units between the layers. Each neuron here is taking a weighted combination of all the neurons here. So this blue segment is just a multi-layer perceptron operating in, um, it's fully connected. Every neuron here is connected to every neuron there, not just the neighborhoods as in a convolution layer. So there's a trick for going, for at any point dropping down to one spatial dimension. And that is we simply take something that has spatial dimensions and we can reshape it into something that, has, that does not have spatial dimensions, that only has the neuron dimension. So as long as the range of I prime, the neuron dimension, is equal to the product of the range of X, the range of Y, and the range of I, these things have the same number of numbers. So now it's just a matter of reshaping this tensor to get down to a, um, a tensor with a, a single spatial dimension. And then we just have a fully connected layer. So the output of neuron J is just uh, the weight between I and is the sum over I of the weight between I and J times the value at I. And that's expressed nicely in this Einstein notation. We're summing over I here. So that's just a multi-layer perceptron. Okay, so now um, we've gone through uh, most of these parameters. We haven't done dilation and grouping. Um, but I'm going to save those for the next unit. So modern trends. I hope this didn't go by too quickly. Um, at least it's recorded. You get a chance to play it back. Modern trends. Convolutions now pretty much exclusively use three by three filters. In the old days, people would use seven by seven filters. Um, but three by three filters are faster and they have a lot fewer parameters. And in modern networks, especially after ResNet, that, that big revolution in 2015, you can make the networks very deep. 
And when you make the networks very deep, um, you can preserve the expressive power of the network just through its depth. But each, each, each layer now being a three by three convolution is faster. And max pooling and dilation, which we haven't talked about, seem to have disappeared. Um, and the ResNet architecture that we're going to introduce later in the class um, is really now dominant. That was a really big uh, revolution. So I'm just going to go through very quickly now some of the early architectures. This is AlexNet. This is 2012. So this was the beginning of the whole thing. So um, there's an input image, and then there's a convolution layer with a ReLU, rectified linear unit uh, activation function. This ReLU is a, a significant innovation of AlexNet, and we'll talk about the significance of that innovation later in the course. There's the weight matrix, um, and uh, we do a pad zero and a stride four to get a, a, a smaller dimension. Um, so there's a first a convolution layer, then a max pool, then a convolution max pool, more convolution, some final fully connected layers. They get it down to scores on the thousand possible classes, and that's the network. VGG, um, here's AlexNet. Here's two versions of VGG, VGG 16 and VGG 19. You can see that the networks are getting deeper. Um, uh, this has become three by three convolutions already. This, this is a monster. This is the inception architecture, Google 2014. So a weird thing about this architecture is that it has, um, it's very deep and training deep networks is, is introduces some serious problems, right? The, as you pass the gradient back from the loss function here down all the way through a very deep network, it tends to get lost. It tends to turn into garbage. So um, what they've done in this network is add two heads here. So you've got a loss function operating here and, and two additional loss functions operating here. And the idea is that these loss functions help train the, the earlier parts of the network. Um, which would not be effectively trained just by this loss function at the end. And it also has this repeated module. Uh, you can see this, this, this module gets repeated throughout the network. Um, and then there's ResNet. And we'll be talking about ResNet uh, later in the class. But this was a big jump. It was a big jump in two ways. It made the networks way deeper. He could do a, you could do 150 layers. And it's very simple. Um, as you can see, the architecture is extremely regular. So ResNet has come to dominate convolutional neural networks. And we're going to be talking about that also later in the class. OK, so that was a very quick pass over convolutional neural networks. Um, I hope it wasn't too fast. Thank you.